Flying high-performance aircraft is not something our bodies are designed for. Any momentary loss of control and your history. But all the information the pilot has about what's happening in the plane and the world around is the product of the senses. Our senses are all we ever have to go on. They inform us where we are in the world and what's going on. But how do we know our senses are telling us the truth? The senses can be fooled. Is it real? or is it fake? And deliberately fooling the senses tells us a lot about how they work. We use our senses all the time. Without them, even the simplest action, like walking down the street, would be impossible. But what are the senses? Obvious, isn't it? The eyes for seeing. the ears for hearing, the nose for smell, and the mouth for taste, the skin for touch. It's via these senses that we experience the world. The changes detected by receptor cells are converted into electrical signals and sent through the nervous system to the brain. Touch something, and this is what happens. A signal travels through your arm, along the spinal cord, and up to the brain. The brain responds by sending messages back. How do you see yourself? Like this? Fancy another view? The brain responds to sensory information, and some areas of the body have more receptor cells than others. So this is how your brain might see you. So, six senses all working overtime every day of our lives. Sound complicated? It is. So we're going to concentrate on two of them. The visual system and the one everybody seems to forget. Our sense of balance. Time for a trip to the movies. To understand how our senses work, it's useful to study illusions. Occasions when our senses are tricked. Not all illusions are strange. Some are so familiar that we don't think about them. Cinema is a visual illusion. How can still images projected at a speed of 25 frames per second and with minute black spaces in between give an illusion of movement? The brain holds on to the image of one picture until the next one appears. The visual sense overwhelms the other senses. So the eye can play tricks, but how? How does the eye work? It's often compared to a camera, and there are similarities. Light strikes the eye. It passes through the cornea. It enters the eye through a hole called the pupil. The light then strikes the lens, which refracts the light rays, so that the image falls on the back of the eye, the retina. So you look at a fir tree, and this is how it would fall on the retina. The image is reduced and upside down. Like a camera aperture, the pupil is enlarged and contracted to control the amount of light entering. And there's a lens. But the eye is not a camera. Instead of a film, the eye has the retina, a layer of light-sensitive cells on the back wall of the eye. This is what the retina looks like. There are two types of cells, rods and cones. Most are rod cells. The cones give detailed color vision. 
they react to different wavelengths of light. Red, blue, green. From the retina, signals are then sent along the optic nerve to the brain. It's not a long journey, in fact, the eyes are an extension of the brain. From the left side, the signal passes to the visual cortex in the right hemisphere, and from the right side to the left hemisphere. Back to the movies. As you may have noticed, this is no ordinary cinema. Most films rely on good pictures and complex soundtracks to move the audience. But in this cinema, the audience really moves. The seats are on hydraulic jacks, which move the audience around in time with the pictures. This activity creates the illusion that they're moving. As you can see from the audience's reaction, this combination of movement and pictures is very effective. Watch this film of a spacecraft in flight. When it appears to turn left, the seats tilt to the left. When it appears to dive, the chairs tip forward and so on. But again, it's all an illusion. The audience aren't flying, just as they're not seeing moving pictures. But they feel as if they are. Why? So, how does the body establish that it's moving? This is the ear. We all know what that does. It allows you to hear. But inside the ear is another structure, the inner ear. This gives us our sense of balance. These are called the semicircular canals, tubes part filled with fluid. So what do they do? Watch this. Or this. Or this. Let's look at it again and see what happens in the inner ear. The movement of the fluid will reflect the movement of the body. In this case, one of the vertical canals dominates. But remember, all the canals are recording information, not just this one. Now a spin. This is the horizontal canal we have to watch. Easy? Try this, a cartwheel. Now it's the third canal that marks the plane of movement. Three actions, three planes of movement. Three different sets of information for the brain to process. So the semicircular canals are particularly sensitive to rotational movements. But what if you simply nod your head? That would be recorded here in this chamber. The fluid here responds to gentle tilting. But how is this information recorded and transmitted to the brain? Let's look inside one of the swellings at the end of one of the canals. There's a clump of sensory hair cells. These are moved by the fluid. The signal is generated and a message is sent to the brain. So your inner ear is working every time you move. You don't have to be an acrobat or an ice skater to know that. Just try walking down a busy street. But it's extreme movements that cause problems. Early pilots found that flying upset their sense of balance. Various strange machines were constructed so that they could become used to the unfamiliar sensations of being able to rotate in the strange three-dimensional world of the air. These were the first flight simulators, trying to produce the same effect on our senses as flying. But today's aeroplanes produce even more problems for our senses. We need something a bit more high-tech. A flight simulator is similar to the cinema we saw earlier. A system of projectors create a big picture of the world outside. The more detailed the image, the more information reaches our retina, the more realistic the perception. Just like the cinema seats, 
the cockpit is mounted on hydraulic jacks so that it can stimulate the pilot's balance organ at the same time as he's watching the image. But there's one big difference from the moving cinema. The changes in the pictures and the movement of the machinery is determined by the pilot as he flies. The world created by the machinery moves as he moves. As the pilot turns, you can see that the cockpit and the image of the world turns too. The tilt of the horizon on the picture matches the information from his sense of balance. Both are telling him he's in a turn. But hang on a minute. Do you really need all this sophisticated equipment to produce the illusion of flying? Lots of people have flight simulators on their home computers, and they don't have moving chairs. But if you can fly using vision alone, why bother with the sense of balance? Time to do an experiment. We've told the pilot to fly a particular course in the simulator. As he flies, we'll be monitoring the movements he makes to control the aeroplane. Here you can see the results. The trace shows the pilot is continually making small adjustments with the controls. But what difference would it make if he had to rely on only visual information? He'll now fly the same course, but with the motion system turned off. No movement, no information from his sense of balance. What's likely to happen now? Nothing disastrous so far. He can still fly as you'd expect. But the record of his movements on the trace does look different. He tends to make bigger, less precise movements of the controls. So what does that show? That our sense of vision and balance working together are better than vision alone. But modern aircraft create a problem for our eyes that we can't investigate in a flight simulator. Private Donna Cruz is one of the first women to train to fly fighter aircraft in the United States Air Force. Part of training is to become used to the enormous forces placed on the body in high-speed maneuvers. And it's not only the forces themselves, it's the effect they have on the senses. Flight simulators can simulate some of the effects of motion, but not the largest. The accelerations known as G-forces. The only way to recreate them is in a centrifuge. Moving in a circle creates a force on the body which makes it feel heavier. The tighter or faster the turn, the greater the force. Donna's first ride in the centrifuge will take her up to 5G. Her body will feel five times heavier than normal. Is ready. Operate. Is ready. Is ready. Metal. Ready. Is ready. Final ready. Stand by. Operator setting limits. Activate your brake. Brake is activated. Three, two, one. Pressure. The centrifuge starts to turn. Donna is strapped to the cabin with her head pointing towards the center, her feet pointing outwards. The main force feels downwards from head to feet and you can see the effect on the tissues of her face. But what's this got to do with the senses? Let's do what you have to, don't overwork. Looking real good. Breathe. Three, three, two, one, coming down. Any light loss? No. Zero, zero. Good ride. Are you ready? Ready. My countdown. Data station. Is ready. Operator. Another trip on the centrifuge. And this is an impression of what Donna would be seeing if she was flying. As the force builds up, her vision tunnels. Starting from the edge, she progressively loses her picture of the world. Keep going for long enough, and she can't see anything. But she isn't unconscious. 
and when the centrifuge slows down, her vision clears. She's perfectly okay. So what's going on? Three, two, one, coming down. To understand what's going on, we need to take another look inside the eye. These are the blood vessels that carry the blood supply into the eye. This is what happens under high G-forces. The blood vessels are compressed and blood flow is reduced. But the finer blood vessels are affected first. No blood, no oxygen, no activity. Vision fades from the periphery inwards. Blacking out would obviously be serious, but so is losing peripheral vision. Why? Time to fly in a different simulator. This time the cockpit is fixed, so the pilot receives no motion information. Images are projected onto a dome. It looks like a huge eyeball. Let's look at these images. In the center, they're fairly detailed. Above and around the edges, very simple. Just blue for the sky and green for the ground. You can see the difference here. Can you think why? Well, it isn't to save money. It's designed to mimic the way the eyes work. Remember the retina with its rods and cones? This is what they look like at the center. Compare this with the periphery. More rods, fewer cones. Cones give color and detail, so the central images here are detailed. Rods give less detail, hence the simpler images around the edges. This represents our peripheral vision. But why is it so important? It's good at picking up movement, that's what the pilot is doing here. He's trying to follow another aircraft, but if he catches sight of something moving in his peripheral vision, he turns towards it, so that he can use the central part of the retina. So impairment of the eye or inner ear is a serious matter for pilots. But what has all this to do with people leading ordinary lives? Take a walk down a busy street. Your senses will be bombarded with information for your brain to process. Lights, movement, color, sound. For some people, it can become overwhelming. But for most of us, we adjust and get used to it. If you want to take your senses to the limits, try here, the world of white knuckle rides. Most of you have tried them, most of you are affected by them when you do, and so you should be. These machines are designed to take your bodies to the edge, but never over it. So what is happening when your body does this? Or this? This? Or this? What do your senses tell you is happening? 